Hey there, Touch Designer developers. Jack Delora here with the Interactive and Immersive HQ. In this video, we're going to look at creating a really cool and interesting liquid painting effect in Touch Designer. This is going to be essentially taking a existing uh, shader toy shader, converting it to be used in the program, and then doing some additional modifications so that we can actually interact with it and paint and use the mouse to control it. So lots of fun to be had with this effect and um, definitely some things to learn along the way. And with that, let's jump right into this. Before we get started on the touch designer portion of the project, I wanted to show you the source of the GLSL shader that we're going to be implementing. So this comes from Shader Toy from user Flockaroo back in 2016. According to the comments here, this is using an interpretation of some techniques from this book. So if you're interested in the kind of theory behind this fluid simulation, I definitely recommend taking a look at the book. We're gonna start off with a blank network today. And before we get into the GLSL component, we're going to add in a couple of uh, texture operators that provide us with both an initialized image to start the effect with and the um, source of the painting quote unquote portion of the effect. So that will have us uh, start with the noise top specifically. And within the noise top, I want to make a few different changes. So I'm going to um, scale my period to 0.25 and flip the monochrome switch off. I'm also uh, going to set my seed to something random. So just slide that slider around until you find something that looks nice. And then we'll come to the common page where I'm going to set my resolution here to be a little bit larger to 1024 by 1024. The last thing I want to do is to set the pixel format to one of the floating point formats, I'm, I'm going to do 16-bit float, but you're also free to do 32-bit float if you'd like. Once you've got that set up, we can continue on to the next operator, which is going to be a circle. And this is going to act as the sort of paintbrush, the um, component that we will be clicking in our uh, panel and moving around will actually be this circle, and that will um, be looped into our feedback loop and cause the nice feedback painting effect to um, not exactly occur, but to be manipulated. So uh, the circle we need to change a little bit as well. That's gonna start uh, with the radius value. I want this to be 0 0.05 for both of those parameters there, nice and small. I also would like to set my softness here to 0.025. And then, um, of course, we uh, probably don't want this background to be appearing like this in order to paint with it. So I think what I'm gonna do here is to swap my operation from the over operation to multiply. And now we just have a little portion of this noise unveiled by our circle. Um, let's just double check and see that we've got our 16-bit floating point output, 1024 by 1024 resolution. We are all good with this operator. So then I'm going to add a null to the end. And this is, uh, this is going to provide us with the input, um, at least part of the input for our GLSL effect. Now that we have that, we can actually start making moves in that direction. So I'm going to add the GLSL top, and then we'll take a look back at Shader Toy for a bit more direction. So here we are back in Shader Toy, and I have gone from the Image tab here over to Buffer A. You'll see here that we have a number of different inputs along the bottom, um, which include a noise texture. We're using an image here, which is uh, the sort of initialized state that you see when you uh, first land on this page. And then we also have here in iChannel 0, if we click on this, a buffer. So that means uh, in touch designer terms, we're going to need some feedback. So if we, if we think about the inputs on our GLSL top, which we have 
uh, at least with the, the standard GLSL top, we got three different inputs. Input one is going to involve uh, our feedback top. We're going to provide some noise into our second input. And then for our initialized state, we can run that into the uh, third input. We'll come back and uh, take a look at the code in a moment. So back in Touch Designer, let's go ahead and set this up. As I mentioned, we're going to need feedback to create this buffer for the first input. So I'm going to add a feedback top in. Uh, I know that I'm going to want, along with the feedback, I'm going to want to be able to route some of my circular paintbrush here into the mix. And so I'm going to add a composite after the feedback top. And then I'll connect the null, which I guess we'll call uh, the brush, null underscore brush. I'm going to plug that into the feedback. I'm also going to plug this into the composite. The composite I'm going to set to over. And then I will connect that output to the very first input of the GLSL top. Uh, for the target top of the feedback, I want that to be this GLSL top. So I'll drag that onto the target top parameter. And then we can continue on adding our um, additional inputs to this top. So as I mentioned, we're going to need uh, noise for the second input. And so I'm going to use a noise top for that. And the noise top, I'm going to want to set up uh, in a similar sort of way to the, the settings that we were using in our previous um, operators in the project. And there's an easy way that I can do this, which is to uh, take the output of the null brush and plug it into this first input. Then on the output page, I'm going to change this RGB setting from this input plus noise to just the noise itself, which is going to um, not include the input uh, connected to this first input into the noise texture at all, but it will uh, still provide us with the resolution that we um, set previously along with the pixel format. That's just a sort of shortcut to getting that uh, set up quickly for us. So I'm going to connect that to the, the second input and then let's go ahead and uh, make two other changes in this noise top. So I want this to be, uh, or to have rather a, a much smaller period. I'm gonna set the period actually at zero so that it, it basically looks like static on an old TV. Um, the other thing that I want to do is to give some animation to this. So I'm gonna use the translate Z parameter and use ABS time dot frame to have that constantly changing and animating. And then I'm just going to turn the viewer there off because I don't need to then continue to look at the uh, pixelated pattern there. Uh, finally, for the initialized state, we could provide an image, we could provide text, we could provide really whatever we want. But um, I'm just going to provide the brush uh, texture as the input, uh, which will give us basically a clean slate every time that we start off uh, or reset the, the feedback effect here and um, let us kind of paint from there. So um, I'm just going to connect the output of null underscore brush into that third input. And now we can actually get into writing some code. Rather than going through the process of writing this out line by line and looking at every single um, uh, addition and change that I end up making to this code, I figured it'd be a little bit easier for you to just be able to copy and paste the final version from the description below. But that said, if you're interested in taking shaders from Touch or from Shader Toy rather and bringing them into Touch Designer, uh, I wanted to point out that there is a great resource uh, from the book that Elbers and the folks at Envoid put together a number of years ago now, but that is still totally relevant and useful. So uh, you can uh, check this out at the link, which it will also be included in the description. It basically talks you through uh, the, the differences between the way things are written in Touch Designer, uh, GLSL versus Shader Toy, and the conversions you'll need to make between those two things. A lot of it is just shifting uh, specific keywords and functions 
the naming of those things for the specific platform. And thankfully, this is a relatively simple uh, uh, shader to convert. So really, it's just a lot of that uh, terminology that we're shifting around. Okay, so I am in my external code editor. I have pasted in the very same code that you are going to uh, have access to in the description below. I just wanted to walk through very briefly some of the changes that I have made here. So first of all, we've done the, the basic conversions uh, from the shader toy terminology to touch designer, which includes stuff like um, our STD2D inputs um, function here, which allows us to access the input, uh, the textures that are connected to the inputs of the GLSL top. We also have a different way of accessing the resolutions of the input textures. Uh, so I've gotten rid of some definitions up top for the resolutions of the uh, first and second textures connected to this GLSL top and replaced those with some expressions. And then uh, most everything else is the same. Um, just cleaned up a little bit. I got rid of some of the commented out code. Um, uh, pretty much all the same, all the same. Uh, once we get into the main function, again, we've, we've done that replacement of the shader toy uh, functions with the corresponding touch designer ones. And then I have changed the way that the um, effect is initialized so that the right mouse button is actually uh, going to enable us to reset the effect instead of the way they had it set up previously. And they also had an additional component which added a little bit of rotation into the mix as well, which I found wasn't as necessary when we start to use this more as a painting-based effect versus uh, just feeding a static image into it and then sort of having it do its own thing. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is because we are trying to, or uh, we are accessing rather the right mouse button, we needed to define a uniform up here in order to connect with the world outside of this GLSL code and, uh, and connect up our chop channels from our mouse. So that has been added here as well. But um, otherwise, pretty straightforward. It basically is... Uh, running in a very similar fashion with no major modifications to the code from what was on Shader Toy. So we're all set here. We can now save the code and then head back to Touch Designer where we're going to see a little warning flag. So this is telling us, warning the uniform URMB is not assigned. So basically we have this uniform in the code. We haven't assigned it here on the vectors page. So we need to do that and define it. So I'm going to type in U, capital R, M, B, hit enter, and then that has been set up. I can set this value here to zero, which would have the same effect as uh, letting go of our right mouse button, or rather not clicking it down. So uh, that'll at least give us an opportunity to see that something is indeed happening in the um, output of this GLSL top. We're getting some cool liquid-like feedback trailing already. But uh, of course, we haven't really added in any way to control this yet. And so that is going to be part of our next step. However, I do want to do one other thing while we're in the GLSL top, and that is to um, come to the GLSL page and set this input extend UV mode uh, or input extend mode UV uh, to repeat rather than zero. If we had left that at zero, once we get rolling here, you'll tend to see some artifacts around the edges of this effect, and this makes things look a little bit nicer. Um, so besides those things, we've got our resolution looking good, and we can continue on to adding the control over this system. So what I'd like to do is, uh, in this case, use a panel uh, as our sort of final output and the location from which we're going to grab the mouse control. It makes things a little bit easier to make this one-to-one -one relationship between the coordinates of our mouse in the panel and the uh, positioning of the circle shape within the panel. 
Um, so that's how we're going to do this. So I'm, I've attached a null, and then I'm going to use an op viewer panel comp. Um, just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to, uh, for the operator viewer here, I'm going to use null one as the um, the operator that I want to show in our op viewer. I'm going to turn this interactive switch off. And then I need to set the resolution correctly here on the width and height page. Now, I think um, because null one is a little bit generic, I'm actually going to switch this to, uh, I don't know, null out or something like that, because that's more of a telling us this is more of the finish point of our project. So I've changed that to null out. When that little dialog came up, I clicked yes to all so that it would fix the reference here for me. And now that we've done that, I'm going to come to the width and the height parameters on the layout page. I'm going to type in op, open and close parentheses. And then I want, within single quotes, null underscore out. I need to access the width dot width of that operator to set my width correctly here in the op viewer. And I'm going to do the same thing for the height, except that I'm going to change dot width here to dot height. When we've done that, that should leave us with a nice 1024 by 1024 square. So to make it a little bit easier to um, experiment with our interaction here and uh, not have to keep flipping back and forth between different windows, I'm going to split my screen up. And in this rightmost pane, I'm going to set this pane type to panel. We'll see we have a little bit of a strange haloing going on right now. We're actually looking at uh, not exactly the correct panel at the moment, we're looking at project one when we actually want to be looking at the op viewer panel. So I can click these uh, rightward facing arrows that will direct me to slash project one slash op viewer one, which is this operator right here. And now I can see that at the uh, correct ratio and resolution. Now I don't want this to use up half of my screen, so I am going to drag the scale of this down pretty significantly. And then what I'm going to do is to move a little bit further back in the network and grab the very handy panel chop. So the panel chop, I need to then um, point towards the op viewer. So I think I'll just open up the parameter window here and then move over to the op viewer uh, comp and drag that onto the component parameter. Then I'll move back over here to the panel uh, chop. And I know already a couple of things that I want to grab from the many channels that are provided. If this is your first time playing around with the uh, panel series of operators, they are great for setting up interactive stuff like this. You can see I'm getting a normalized uh, position in the parameters that we're outputting right now. And I also get a separate normalized position when I actually click down on the mouse, along with um, tracking as to which mouse button I have uh, clicked down, which makes it very useful for setting up more complex functionality. So anyways, I don't need all of these channels. And to make things a little bit easier for myself, I'm just going to add in some in this select parameter. So I want L select. I want R select. And then I want U and V. So those are the four channels that I'm going to be accessing. Um, I have put spaces in between those names so that they'll be brought in independently. And now that I have done that, it is time to take these and do a little bit of work with them. So I'm going to basically split these out into two branches. And I'll use a select chop for that. So Basically, we need to modify the UV parameters here because the positioning of our circle, which is going to come from the position of our mouse within this panel, uh, has a has a range of negative five to positive, or sorry, negative zero point five to positive zero point five uh, in the kind of default state of things in this operator. So we can use some math to change the range of our UV coordinates so that they match up with the circle. In this select one, I'm going to grab the U and the V channels. And then I will add a math chop after that. And here I'm going to set on the range page 
um, the two range to fall from negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. After that, I'm going to uh, copy the select chop and paste it up top. In this one, I'm just going to grab the L select. I guess I can do it this way. L select and R select channels. Those are my mouse buttons. And then I'm going to merge all of these things back together into a single um, chop. And then I'll add a null to the end. And I'm going to call this uh, null mouse or something like that. I've got these channels now, which I can start making references to in my project. So first of all, for the positioning of this circle, I want to use the U and V channels. So I'm going to make a chop reference from the U channel to the center X uh, parameter, and then the V channel is going to go to the center Y parameter. Then if I click and drag over here on the right, you can see I'm now able to move the circle around and get some very cool drippy sort of effects. However, I don't really want the circle to be displayed all the time because that would mean I could just sort of leave it at a certain area in the project or the, uh, the output rather, and it'll just constantly be generating this liquid like effect. So I can use this L select chop channel that I've set up for myself and connect that to the fill alpha parameter here. And that means whenever we have not clicked the left button down uh, with the mouse over this panel, it will cause the circle to become transparent and disappear from the output. And then anytime that I click down with the left mouse button again and drag, it will reappear and allow us to paint. So that is, uh, that's basically the drawing functionality. And then for the ability to reset back to a, an initialized state, I'm going to use this R select channel and Back over here in our GLSL top on the vectors page, remember we set up this uniform for the right mouse button. So I can make a chop reference from this R select channel over to the first value um, that we have here and make a chop reference. And then when I right click with the mouse over the panel, it will reset uh, back to a blank canvas and then we can start drawing again. So if we then uh, open this op viewer up as an external window, we can see that our painting effect is indeed functional and giving us this really cool uh, liquid sort of effect courtesy of that shader from Shader Toy. Let's take a look at one additional area that we can make some modifications to change the way that this looks a little bit. So if we come back to our network, we can actually look at adding in color in a slightly different way. Um, what we can do is to use a technique borrowed from Paquetta 12 and others, where we can use noise to essentially recolor the output. So what I'm gonna do here is to connect the GLSL top directly to both of the inputs of this noise top. I'm then gonna come to the noise tops output page and switch the RGB here to simply noise. And then I'm gonna to come to the noise page itself and flip the monochrome switch off. Then I can take this and connect it to the null out. And we can see we've got some really amazing color over here on the right already. What we'll notice, however, is that when we start to draw and paint, the areas that we have uh, most recently sort of clicked on have a very noisy texture to them. We can, we can bring this a little bit uh, into our control via the period setting on this noise. And if I set this to something like 15, for example, we'll get a much more subtle gradient. However, we might still want to play around with the seed value to get ourselves a uh, color scheme that we like. So each time that we manipulate the seed value here, we end up with a totally different uh, color scheme. And you'll notice that some of these are really beautiful and provide some super interesting results. So that is uh, one thing that I would definitely recommend checking out that can add some really cool variety into the mix.
And then the other thing is uh, to play around with the noise that we've connected to the second input. This is having actually a quite a big impact on the way that things are moving around on screen. And so for example, if I change the uh, period, well, actually, if we start to play around with things like the period, um, let's go ahead and turn off this ABS time.frames animation momentarily, and then come to the noise page. I'm gonna set my period up to something like five, maybe. And then we can come back to the op viewer and take a look. You can see that the way that things start to move around looks different when we do that. Um, we don't have such a, a tight pattern of noise that is pushing the color around in space anymore. And also the noise is uh, staying static. And so the way that things start to move throughout our um, little simulation will change. And especially once we start to reset, you can see here, we get some really cool and interesting results. With that said, I hope that you have enjoyed putting this one together. There are a ton of opportunities to continue exploring with this one. And hopefully this has gotten you excited for taking uh, a further deep dive into the possibilities of GLSL and even just taking some of the examples that already exist and bringing them into the program. Hey folks, thanks for watching. If you like our YouTube content, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. The HQ Pro is the only comprehensive educational resource and community for immersive design, touch designer, and creative tech pros. In the HQ Pro trainings, we cover almost any topic you can think of, and we go way more in depth than we do in our YouTube tutorials. We have a private group where Matthew Reagan, myself, and our other industry veteran and pioneer teachers answer your questions every single day. If that sounds cool, click the link in the description to learn more. And if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe for more free touch designer and immersive content.